Hi, welcome to Week 7 Lecture, Fundamentals of Digital Image Output. My name is Anne Verdaniger. In today's lecture, I will provide an overview to input processing workflow before then looking at some fundamental concepts related to image output. The lecture will include concepts of monitor calibration and working space, that is the space you're working in to complete your editing. To also look at concepts of colour gamut, colour space, before providing an overview of possible print output devices and their image preparation requirements. This semester I introduce you to the idea of workflow and I provided you a simplified diagram which outlined each of the important steps in your workflow this semester. However, now that you've developed more technical skills around capture, I will give you a more complex diagram for your workflow. I will suggest to you that this workflow begins at pre-capture through to capture, input processing and then final destination which will be defined by what type of output file you need to produce. So at pre-capture it's about the observation and the evaluation of light. So remember I said to you very early in the semester that capture begins even before the camera is set up. That is that the observation of light, the lighting scenario, You've had some great lectures which cover the physical quality of light and the use of filters to colour correction and management of light quality and strength. So now you should be developing a sense of what light is, its quality, strength, colour and how the direction and type of light changes the aesthetic of the image captured. At raw capture is where you have to set the camera for the prevailing lighting conditions. You are asked to think about the exposure settings, dynamic range of the capture device, your camera, and to analyse the subject brightness range of the scene, that is, the tonal range from the brightest to the darkest tone of the scene before your camera. Observing the light and understanding how you would like the scene rendered defines how you will set up the image capture, the exposure. Recognising the dynamic range of your capture device, a camera, and observing identifying the overall subject brightness range impacts directly on the capture exposure settings used. So your dynamic range, the capability and the capacity for your camera to capture what range of tonality within the subject brightness range. Exposure is measured through the reading of histograms and you have developed an understanding of bit depth. But the subject brightness range, the difference between the highlight shadow and the shadow information, and how many steps of tone in between. In the past few weeks in class, we've been working with input processing. We visited the concept of the creation of a digital master file or negative. Input processing, remember, is replacing all the automated pr processing that happens in camera when you photograph to capture in a JPEG format. When you photograph to capture raw data, the input processing has to be completed by you. This provides you with full creative control over the final look of the image, which is good. It's a positive thing. But today I'd like to talk to you more about setting up your workspace, the monitor calibration, and choosing correct colour space, and thinking about how you're going to know the output usage of your image. How to set you set your parameters for outputting the image from raw processing software, Adobe Camera Raw, well, is fully dependent on what you're wanting to do with the final image. Step one, now let's revisit this model, this workflow model. So step one of the workflow flow model was for you to become proficient in using Adobe Bridge to import your files from camera or card. And Adobe Bridge is a really powerful software interface between the camera and input processing software Adobe Camera Raw. But it's in Adobe Bridge that you're able to sort and rate your files, apply metadata information, and maybe output a, a contact sheet or a web gallery for future reference. And also it's where you can open your files for input processing directly from Bridge to Adobe Camera Raw. Always remember to use Adobe Bridge as a first step in your input process. Adobe Camera Raw is the tool we are using this semester to create a digital master file, the base for point for your output process. 
in Adobe Camera Raw you've had the opportunity to practice to you know, applying parametric or global changes to a single or multiple images as well as you know, using um, the adjustment brush for localised changes. You also have learned how to apply sharpening and to um, crop your images without making permanent changes. At this point you can choose to save your image as a RAW file that is a DNG or a pixel based file format. What file format you will save your image as? Now this depends entirely on how you're going to use the file as a next step either in post-production or just to output. If you're going to continue to work with this file either preparing it for pr print then saving to a PSD or a TIFF file format is a correct way to handle the output. Why? Well, you need to retain that 16-bit pixel depth of the file. If you save it as a JPEG, then it will automatically be downsized to an 8-bit pixel depth file. If you are just wanting to upload your image to social media or send it an email, then a JPEG is adequate. Remember when you save from your digital master file, this original file is not overwritten. The JPEG, TIFF or PSD file, or the DNG file for that matter, is a copy of the master file. If you have multiple raw input processes from a single file, such as monochrome, split tone, colour, then you can save these as DNG files. Just remember to change the file name to indicate what type of input process has been applied. This makes the creative process much more automated and efficient. You can then save pixel-based images from any of these selected DNG options. So what I'm saying is, before you decide to output your file, you have to decide whether it's going to print, if it's going to be used as a screen-based image. So each of these options, to print, to web, to television or projection, have different output requirements. So when you're thinking about image output, there's some important decisions to be made. These decisions are based on how the image will be used. It determines the selection of colour space and bit depth, the image size, how much sharpening is applied, and those parameters, all those parameters, depend on the destination or the use image, whether for print, projection, web or television. Each of them has a set specific set of requirements. From Adobe Camera Raw you can save an 8-bit or 16-bit file at DNG, TIFF, PSD, Photoshop file or JPEG formats. In Adobe Camera Raw, in the Workflow Options interface, there's a series of prompts to, that ask you to set up the output colour space, bit depth, size and sharpening. It also allows you to open the image directly into Adobe Photoshop as a smart object if you're working with web-based images. The Save As interface asks you to select a destination, so where do you want to save the file. It allows you to set up new folders. It asks you to you know this is where you'll change your file naming here. It asks you what format that you want to output and if you're, setting, if you're outputting as a JPEG, what size. There's an option again to change your colour space and image size and apply some preset sharpening here. So in the Save As interface, ask you your destination, do you want to change your file name, this is your file format, not up here, okay, your colour space, image sizing and output sharpening. So what file format? It absolutely depends on whether you're going to continue to work the image. Are you going to? Is it a base image for a composited um, composition? Are you going to prepare it for print? Do you want to send it as an email, or you just want to save it as a DNG for later reference? So when thinking about the fundamentals of digital output, it's absolutely necessary to identify what the image output destination is what's its usage and what production medium are you going to use. 
So what I'm referring to is whether the image will be printed or whether it be used as a screen-based image. This subject primarily looks at the output print using um, photographic paper in a professional Epson inkjet printer. However, the information regarding output for magazine or newspaper print or as well as large signage will be included as well as a number of different print output options. So when you're thinking about um, printing image, what type of substrate that you're going to print on. Um, each of these as well will require some different work. When you decide to print your image you will need to know what the device is that will provide the service and each device has specialised output requirements. These may be broken down to some categories such as offset printing and pre-press production, dye sublimation, digital halftone, digital chromogenic and inkjet printing. So if you're sending your image for offset or pre-press production, so that's commercial um, high output print process, which is no, can be found in magazine, book and newspaper printing industry, you need to um, prepare your file and output your file as a CMYK file format at 300 ppi. Newsprint is, is different to this. Newsprint will only require a 150 to 200 ppi um, resolution file. Why? Because it's a lower resolution output. Dye sublimation printing process refers to a type of print process where dye based inks are exposed to a heating element. The dye melts off the ink film and onto the receiving paper. A special paper is required to receive the dye sub. Dye sublimation inks are quite robust and light fast, however, this is now fast becoming old technology as inkjet printers becoming industry standard. You still find this type of printer used for perhaps fabric and merchandising, however, they are not fine art printers. So when you're working, if you're sending your image to be printed on no, um, any of this type of merchandising, it's an RGB colour space with a 300 ppi resolution file. Digital chromogenic printers have been around since the 1950s when Kodak first introduced colour print material. This process produced the best digital prints early on. Printers such as Lightjet and Symbolic Sciences use silver halide colour photographic paper with red, green and blue digitally controlled lasers exposing the photosensitive emulsion on the paper medium. The print material was processed using traditional photochemical processes. This is a, a process that I'm quite familiar with. So other digital chromogenic printers included the Durst Lambda along with Lightjet and these were prop popular in ProPrint labs for especially for large um, print sizes. Neither of these machines are in production now. Digital Mini Labs also use this process via either the Fujifilm, Frontier or Noritsu, but they were limited with their output size. Prints produced using this technology, um, using prints produced using this technology, because it uses that traditional photosensitive silver halide photo print material, the life expectancy is limited to around 60 years. This is now at the low end of longevity of professional inkjet printer output, but I'll talk to you a little bit more about this later in the in the lecture. Digital half tone printing is a is a commercial process which uses four color plates on a large web press. They're used to print magazines and such. The print industry, as it as it declines, has led to a demand um, in short run half tone pr reproduction. HP uses an, an indigo digital offset printing press and um, these can print up to seven inline colours. Blurb, which is an online um, book printing service, um, uses a HP indigo printer. It, it allows for short run reproduction at where you can order you no know, print such as books, but also greeting cards, calendars and other consumer products. To prepare your images, you should use a CMYK proofing system. 
So they look for your file as a CMY color space with a 300 PPI um, input image. Be aware though, I think Blurb, I believe Blurb um, prefers you to send an RGB file and they do the conversion in-house. So if in doubt, always ask. Inkjet printers. It has a dominant place in both the professional and consumer print industry now. They're easy to use and affordable. Um, this pr print process allows the professional to have ultimate control over image output and production. And that's what I love. No, I, can, I know um, through soft proofing and output that what I see on my screen is going to come out of that printer. There are two dominant type of inkjet printing processes. The thermal printhead is used by Canon and HP and the piezo electronic printhead is used uniquely by Epson. Now you don't need to know the differences between those two um, but what you do need to know is that they require a different file input file size. So if you're printing with a Canon or a HV printer, your input file needs to be 300 ppi. If you're printing with an Epson printer, you need a file for no input file size of 240 or 360 ppi. But inkjet um, printers have um, quite a bit of difference between the professional grade inkjet and the consumer grade. So consumer grade printers use a die and whereas professional grade printers use pigments, no, exquisitely fine pigments in solution. And it's a difference between these two um, different um, medium, print mediums is the archivability. So the pigment is a much more stable um, and archival quality. So the professional printers have a larger range of colours between 8 and 12 colour options and um, professional printers are also able to print at a finer print, finer resolution which provides a higher quality output. So on campus here we have an Epson 7800 and um, a 3880 printer. So when you think about the detail, no, let's look at this detail from this tiny little area here. And this is what it looks like at that high resolution printer printing. So both the 78 and the 38 can print at 700 or 2880 dpi, which provides a really fine resolution and it, it creates that illusion of a continuous tone or a continuous image so the, the dots are invisible. The 3880, when you think about these are the, the ink sets that they use, and look at the photo black. So photo black is when you use you print onto gloss, semi-gloss or luster. But the photo black is supported by light black and light light black. There is two levels of magenta and also two levels of cyan. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the ink sets provide a a finer quality of reproduction of your di digital image from screen to print. So let's just have a look quickly at some printer and image resolution terminology. PPI refers to pixels per inch and I'm sure you know this already and it's a measurement of digital file linear pixel resolution. Okay, the higher the PPI the more pixels that make up the image. DPI refers to dots per inch and it describes the num size or the number of dots per linear inch that a printer can produce. The finer the dot and the more dots per linear inch, the more detail and the less banding will appear on the printed image. So when we think about the Epson 3880 being able to print at 2880 DPI and have that correlation to more detail and less banding in the printed image. So it's a higher quality, higher resolution image that it's printing. So when you're thinking about printing your work, ask yourself some questions. 
Who will be printing the images? Is it you or are you going to output to a third party print service? What type of substrate or material will the images be printed on? And also what is the final size images? So is it is it just going to be a small um, 20 by 25 centimetre or do you want a large wall size print? The answers to these questions will then define what resolution the image must be set to and how much or what type of output sharpening must be applied. It also then defines the output colour space. Some print processes as you've seen um, require a CMYK output rather than RGB model that we work with. If in doubt then ask these questions of the print bureau. But remember, it's absolutely necessary to work on a calibrated monitor in a stable and suitably lit workspace. Let's have a look at what I mean. So let's get into some detail around the technical concepts of digital image output starting at monitor calibration. But before I do that, please check that your monitor is set correctly. That is, your monitor colour space is set to either Adobe RGB or Profoto or sRGB or CMYK depending on, remember, the destination of the image. What's color monitor calibration? And I believe Glenn's been over this already. It's a process of setting the monitor to display correct brightness, contrast, white point and colour. It's the only way you can ensure that the images that you're working on will output successfully. If you're working on a monitor which displays your image either too dark or too light, then the resulted printed image will not match the on-screen representation. So having your monitor calibrated provides you with the confidence to know that what you're seeing is correct colour and tone. Calibrating your monitor allows the RGB profiles to be displayed in a correct manner. These profiles are defined by the white point and the red, green, blue primary colours. These dis profiles describe an additive colour space. So here I've provided you with some guidelines for setting the calibration of your monitor when you actually get around to do it. Before I proceed, I'd like to say that not all monitors are capable of being calibrated. Here at JCU we use the Apple Max as an industry standard, as the monitors are suitable to be calibrated, and they are also quite a stable monitor. I do the monitors once every six months and I find that there's very little shift from you know, calibration to calibration. To, do, to replace this, um, you know, this iMac or the Mac um, monitor, with another brand is sometimes double or triple the, the price of our Mac monitors. You can use a, a device such as Spider, X-Rite, Color Monkey, or Color Eyes to profile. And these devices are used to create a display profile which includes setting up the color temperature, tonal repro reproduction, luminance of the display or the screen. When calibrating your monitor, you should take, in, take some environmental variants into account, such as ambient light and how much light flare is falling onto your computer screen. The room you do your editing in should have static, ambient light and colour temperature. What do I mean? So if you have a window in the room, then always pull the blind down before you begin. As the day moves on, the amount of light and the colour temperature of the light will change. This will affect how you see and assess your on-screen images. Also ensure that any um, room lighting does not create light flare on the screen. If you can see a reflection on the light, uh, of the light, then move the computer and or the desk until this disappears. Be aware of how colour is reflected from surfaces, including clothing, to the screen when editing. The work environment should be colour neutral. And if you're serious, you will have a workspace with neutral grey walls with no more than 60% re reflectance value. Your clothing should be the same. Although, as a rule, I just wear black when working on my computer and editing. 
So let's look at some key terms you should know when talking about screen, that is monitor calibration. Colour gamut refers to the levels of colour your monitor can, can display. In the system preferences you can set the monitor working space. As you can see I have my monitor set to RGB 1998. This defines how many levels of colour my monitor can display. Colour space describes how the colours are organised within the display. It defines what levels of each specific colour and tone may be represented. So here we're looking at the Profoto, um, Adobe RGB, sRGB and CMYK colour spaces. The large horseshoe shape at the back is visible colour. Ensure that you have selected the correct colour space for output in the Output Workflow options in Adobe Camera Raw. So it's no use outputting to um, Adobe RGB if you're sending it to pre-press. You need to go down and find your generic CMYK profile. Here it is. If you look at the background image, large horseshoe shape represents visible colour. Okay, there it is in the background there. This is the colour visible to the naked eye. This is our colour spectrum. If you then look at the first large triangle named Profoto RGB, you'll see that the colour space, that this colour space can display colour even beyond what we can see. Can you see the elongated green and blue colour? So the blues and the greens represented, or the ability to represent those colours. The next largest colour space is Adobe RGB, and this is my default. If I'm working with landscape images primarily consisting of greens and blues, vibrant greens and blues, then the Pro Photo colour space would be much better as my default. So as you can see, the RGB colour spaces can only display some of the visible colour. The problem here is that what we see through the camera may be a little bit different to what we see um, on the screen. This colour space is suitable for um, portrait work, great for portrait work, and great for mostly, you no, know, most landscape work. But when you have those vibrant deep blue skies, um, you know, in the middle of winter that we see up here in North Queensland, that's those colour here in Profoto but they're still represented adequately in Adobe RGB. Let's have a look at sRGB. So think about sRGB colour space. Now this is television and web, so it's a much smaller colour space. And if you think about this centre area here, so it's going to display adequately most colour on screen. Even smaller is the CMYK working space. This, the big picture here though is if you're always working for CMY output then the colour display you're working on should be set appropriately otherwise you'd need to be very careful with colour conversion all the time. When you're calibrating your monitor ensure that you've chosen the correct colour space. In this image here what we're seeing is the visible colour space okay once again that large horseshoe shape and what colour Epson 3880 can print. So the correlation between output with the Epson 3880 and the Adobe RGB colour space is no, they're quite similar output and colour spaces. So when you look at this slide you can um, begin to understand the correlation between colour gamut and output. You need to know what the colour gamut the out of the output printing device has and then define the output colour space accordingly. What you're looking at currently is Adobe RGB colour space and Epson 3880 output, no the colour space or the gamut for 3880 exhibition fibre paper which is like a luster paper. It's, um, it's not quite as glossy as a semi-gloss which you'll be using. Adobe RGB colour space um, and what the, 30, the Epson 3880 can reproduce is defined here quite 
beautifully. The Adobe RGB colour space is the colour wire frame and the Epson 3880 fibre is a white um, wire frame. So you can see that the um, Adobe RGB maps beautifully within a Epson 3880 printer um, gamut and profile. So let's have now at have a look at the Pro Photo colour space as represented by the white colour um, frame, the white colour frame, and what can be reproduced by the Epson 3880 printer on the same exhibition fibre paper. So looking at the Pro Photo, which is a white colour frame, which is much larger than what can be represented on paper, which is the Epson 3880 exhibition fibre paper. Like I said, it's like a luster paper. As you can see, the Pro Photo colour space is much larger than what can be reproduced. Next week, when we begin to print, I'll introduce you to strategies, strategies which you will be able to know you can use to map this colour space either up from R Adobe RGB to Epson 3880 output or down from Profoto to Epson 3880 output. So what you can see on your monitor at times is just a little bit different to what can be printed and when I talk to you about images being in and out of gamut this is what I'm talking about. What we're seeing in Adobe RGB colour space what's in and out of gamut, what is reproducible um, from R Adobe RGB to Epson 3880 and what's in and out of gamut, what can be reproduced you know, from a, the Pro Photo, what we're seeing on colour space, what we're seeing on our screen and to the Epson 3880 are two different things. With one single photograph I just want you to see how the histogram changes. So watch the histogram up in the top right hand corner as I alter the colour space of the image. See, Please note how the colour and the tone is re represented in the histogram. So here if you look at the histogram and let's have a look. This is with my colour space set at Adobe RGB 1998 at 16 bits channels, sRGB, Profoto, CMYK and US Newsprint. So you can see how each of those profiles limits or changes how the colour and tone is represented or mapped in your image. So before calibrating your screen ensure that your, your computer screen is set to the correct colour space. So you're going to go to edit, down here to colour settings, which will bring up this dialog box and I just want you to follow these instructions. So next week in class we look at calibrating monitors and setting your colour space on your machine.